everyone. Um, and we are happy to start this very early morning panel on dark patterns. And thank you very much for joining us on a Friday morning. I know it may be hard, but here we are. Uh, so our panel is about dark patterns, definitions, and evidence for regulators. And this panel is organized by INRIA, which is a French National Institute for Research in Digital Science and Technology. So what are dark patterns? Um, for those of you who were here yesterday afternoon, you probably heard already that um, dark patterns are now included in the new EU law in DSA. Um, and in the US, it's also covered by the recent California Privacy Rights Act where dark patterns are defined and now being regulated in the US. So prior to these definitions in the text of law, the design practitioners and academia have also defined dark patterns in various ways, proposing also different types of dark patterns and, and various kinds of taxonomies of dark patterns. So the goal of our panel is to discuss how we should define dark patterns and whether we should define them um, what's even more important is how can we regulate them? And for regulating dark patterns, we are going to analyze what evidence can be collected and what evidence can be considered useful for the regulators. So let me guide you through a couple of examples of dark patterns. Um, one typical example is when users are asked to pause or delete their account. Um, but actually, uh, what you see here is only one option, right? So you can only disable, so mute the account. Uh, what you probably don't see is that you also have another option here on the very bottom that is not really visible um, for unprepared users that allows actually to delete your account. So this is one typical case. Another one that many of you have, I'm sure, seen, something like this, in the space of the cookie banners, um, where we have uh, only one option to accept. But, well, actually, this is not true. There is a way to reject. It's just, again, hidden so well that unprepared users are not able to detect this. Um, so this type of dark patterns, some people call obstruction. Some people call it manipulating visual choice architecture or false hierarchy, where accept and reject are not presented in the same way. There is another dark pattern here, which is related to emotional manipulation. Because here, cookies are presented as something positive, something nice. There is a very happy person eating cookies on this, on this picture here. So again, we can have multiple dark patterns presented only in one single <coughs> interface. Um, so these examples are quite simple and illustrative. But as you will see in today's panel, there are many more complex types of dark patterns. And without further delay, let me introduce myself and the fantastic panelists that we have here today. So uh, I'm Natalia Bielova. I'm a research scientist at INRIA, um, where I work a lot on dark patterns as myself. Um, and specifically, one example <coughs> of dark pattern that I dislike a lot um, is, is in the space of cookie banners where you cannot really easily find a way to reject. Um, so I believe that to address dark patterns, we have to ensure very productive exchanges between regulators and uh, researchers in various areas, in privacy and security, in human-computer interaction, design, and law. And we also have to provide methods when, to demonstrate when these dark patterns actually exist and build tools, like detection tools for regulators to help them identify those dark patterns. Our panelists today here are um, Colin Gray, who is an associate professor um, at uh, Indiana University Bloomberg. Colin, would you like to present yourself? Good morning to all of you for making, thank you for making it out. Um, my name is Colin Gray. Um, I've been working on dark patterns really since 2015 with uh, some of my first uh, published work uh, starting in 2017. Uh, 
I come into this space as a designer. I originally trained as a, a graphic designer. I worked in industry, and I trained as a social scientist um, in human-computer interaction. So my perspective might be a little bit different from some of the others on the panel today, because uh, my perspective is really coming from academia and also looking at how we can understand why these design practices emerge in industry, what are some of the, the tensions that cause them to emerge, and how can we promote a transdisciplinary dialogue around these concerns so that we're not only speaking the same language, but that we're able to understand uh, the limits and the opportunities that are enabled by each of our disciplinary perspectives. Um, and in fact, um, the cookie banner here is the place that started uh, my collaboration with Natalia and with Christiana, who's here in the audience, uh, looking at the lawfulness of uh, various dark patterns in the context of consent and cookie banners. Um, but uh, we've done a lot of work over the last couple of years to broaden that perspective. Uh, first, to build an ontology of uh, dark patterns so that we can start uh, building uh, knowledge that is shared across regulatory uh, and academic spaces, uh, but also looking um, increasingly at what methodologies do we need to build evidence for the presence of dark patterns and their potential harms as well. Thank you, Colin. Um, our next uh, speaker on the panel is Laura Litwin. Laura? My turn. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, well, hello everyone. I'm glad to see you people woke up. I was a little worried at some point. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, I am also in a, perhaps a little in a different position than, than kind of other speakers at the conference or other speakers on the panel. Um, I'm the, well, now I'm the director of uh, the French company that's part of the Behavioral Insights team. Uh, I can tell you more about what the Behavioral Insights team is after, if you want. Uh, but basically, we were a behavioral science unit born within the British government, separated out of the British government, so we're now independent. And our job is essentially to build bridges between research and practice, between research and policy. But beyond the kind of like translation work, which is fundamental, also just trying to go towards building tools for policy making and implementing what research is also recommending and also just so kind of this this ongoing dialogue between building more evidence for policymakers, making sure the policymakers have the tools to also generate research and insights themselves uh, and, and trying to find kind of practical solutions for all these things that we're all constantly discussing. Um, in terms of dark patterns, we've started talking about online harm a few years ago. Uh, because very obviously this is something that everyone was starting to perceive, but also something where we see that that behavioral sciences and then the way a person is going to behave is fundamental. And so understanding kind of like what guides online decisions, what guides online choice, and also kind of how the environments online are built is going to be a fundamental field of study also for behavioral scientists. Um, and so this is kind of how we came at it, and dark patterns obviously was was a very, a, became a very important kind of field of study. And uh, I don't know how to go, because I know that's kind of the first question we're gonna discuss, which is kind of how you define dark patterns as a field. But, um, and, uh, and this is where, so the type of work that we do in this field is um, try to kind of like summarize it here, but is, is really about kind of, well, this does on one hand ensuring that policymakers understand, but also uh, in terms of their work, which is around kind of more consumer protection. So how do you actually inform, train, protect consumers and Internet users? How do you talk about uh, what's going on online? And, uh, and so that goes into kind of like what do you create as guidelines? What do you create as... Uh, kind of campaigns to help people protect their data, et cetera, but also uh, more on the kind of regulation front and also the, the more kind of enforcement front. Can you make sure that the policymakers and regulators have the tools to detect? Uh, and so this is where we work with them, uh, but a lot in the UK and now a bit more in France, uh, in Canada as well. We've done some work kind of working with regulators to build the audit tools that they need to actually detect the patterns, detect the stuff that they're looking for. Um, and then working also on kind of training their staff, which is a really important thing. So it becomes really, really practical, our work, is, you know, once you know all of this, what do you actually do to make it work in the real world for regulators and, and for, for regulators in their enforcement work and in their kind of protection work and their communication work? Uh, more on this later. Thanks a lot. Um, our next speaker is Bertrand Payes. Um. Hi everyone, thank you to be here and to welcome uh, me. I'm, I'm, I represent the CNIL, so the French Data Protection Authority. I'm the head of technology and innovation there, uh, which is a division that oversees technological expertise, 
a newly created AI department and, and our uh, innovation lab, within which we have uh, designers working on design patterns for several years now. We, uh, we have issued a, a KEP a report on, on, on design choices a, a few years back, and we have a website that's called <laughs> design dot knil dot fr that you can where you can find resources we also i, I just would like to mention because we will focus on, on dark patterns but we can also find on that website what we have called actually only patterns but what we feel is more bright patterns and how we can help typically uh, dpos to 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 understand the the design blocks that they, they're using for for information obviously we're very interested in in that matter uh, and uh, within this innovation lab, we we try with this innovation lab, we try to to build bridges with uh, academia, obviously, and to to bring. You have the, actually the same goal as Laura and Colleen, I think, and everyone here. How we can build on what the academia research is is finding in actual cases, uh, where uh, uh, today it's um, it's not necessarily um, uh, evidence based or science based all the time uh, that decisions are made. Thank you very much. And our next uh, speaker is Dries Heispers. Thank you very much, Natalia, and good morning, everybody. Yes, yeah, so I work at the Dutch Authority for Consumers and Markets, and as the name already tells you, we are not a privacy enforcement agency in the Netherlands. That's another authority. However, the work on dark patterns is equally important for us. And let me just take a step back. So I do coordinate the work that we do in the digital economy in terms of consumer protection. And our real goal <clears throat> is to make the internet or digital spaces safe and trusted areas for people to shop in, because basically we're all about consumer transactions, which I think where we vastly differ from the um, privacy community. Um, so. When looking at this area, there are, of course, a multitude of challenges. And online manipulation is one of them. And it's also a one that we prioritize and that we think is actually very important. So um, we do see online influencing or manipulation, as we call it, across a wide variety of different sales channels. And I think that's also important because very often we speak about the web. I think the web is a too limited approach. So we're also speaking about social media. We're speaking about voice assistants. Uh, we're talking about um, dark patterns in apps. And I think very importantly in the near future and probably already today, we're also talking about dark patterns in AR and VR based environments. Um, think about the metaverse, which, of course, is a, is a buzzword, but um, all the developments around it where these techniques are being used is a space in which I think we will see uh, a lot of potential for manipulation uh, through dark patterns. So our work in relation to deceptive design or dark patterns has been there for a long time, although we in the past never called it that. <clears throat> but we have really started calling it in those terms about four years ago when we used um, a possibility to publish guidelines and explain how we see those online influencing techniques in relation to the piece of legislation that we work with which is the unfair commercial practices directive or the ucpd in short so we published a lengthy document in which we approached various different techniques um, and um, communicated to the market where we draw the line in terms of what's admissible and what isn't. Um, we've also done a lot of enforcement in the area. I'm just going to very quickly name three cases. There is plenty more. Um, and the first case is to show you that we were doing dark patterns long before we called it dark patterns. And I think the coin had only, uh, sorry, the, the term had only been coined three years earlier by, by Harry, who was on a panel yesterday. But this is a case, this is a, a screenshot from a case that we did against Ryanair, who we find for using deceptive design. If you bought a flight ticket, you would then proceed to the next page where you got the question whether, well, it was not really a question, you were being offered the possibility to um, get a, um, an insurance, a travel insurance. And what you were presented with was a scroll down menu, drop down menu, where you could select your country and then you had, had an insurance. The, the only way to not be insured, and 
some background, most Dutch people are, you know, have a, have a travel insurance permanently, so they don't need it. Um, we're, we're over insured. <laughs> uh, um, the only way to not insure yourself was to know that you would find the option don't insure me between Den Denmark and Finland. Um, so I leave you to guess how many people um, did not insure themselves. So uh, I think I'm going to leave it there and I'm very interested in, tea, in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we will go directly to questions. So this panel will be very interactive. So first we will be discussing a number of questions ourselves and then we will open the floor for the audience. So the first and very straightforward question is, we are discussing um, regulations, right? So how we regulate dark patterns. And so what are the existing and upcoming laws that are already um, covering um, and, and regulating the presence of dark patterns? Um, maybe Bertrand, you want to start? Yeah. Um, so obviously, GDP, uh, GDPR is one of the, of the coming law, um, one of the existing law uh, already regulating dark patterns. So I would refer to the ADPB guidelines on on uh, deceptive uh, patterns in social media, I guess it's uh, right, uh, the right name, where we try to provide some insights about that. And, and what you will find in that guidelines is that uh, first, the, the principle of fairness in Article 5 of the GDPR is, is the basic uh, obligation that would, uh, can be used by regulator to, uh, to qualify a dark pattern and, and, and sanction, sanction it. Obviously, with other type of uh, other, other principles uh, uh, with which um, uh, several uh, decisions have been made in, in, in the past years. Uh, transparency, transparency is the most, is the most evident one, and the, the way, the, all the obligations that you have uh, about informing the users and getting consent and informed consent and free consent uh, for certain action, either based on I mentioned GDPR, but uh, we also have used a lot, obviously, uh, e-privacy directive combined with the definition of consent in GDPR. So the recent changes that you've seen in cookie banners are really related with the entry into force of GDPR that have changed the, the notion of consent that is used in e-privacy and, and, and then uh, uh, helped us to to uh, require a more balanced uh, design for 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 for, for cookies. Uh, perhaps two other principle applies from from GDPR. One is accountability, uh, which is an important aspect, I guess, in the discussion today, because um, one of the key issues for regulators is to define whether you you need to to say, okay, this is always. If you say this is a law, this is prohibited, people would try to get into, into the, the the case, the the box where it is a law, but perhaps without with, without really doing what you expect them to do. So we building on accountability. We we want to have also a case by case approach and and first let the companies the liberty to perhaps design uh, patterns in, in a way that is not, uh, that can be more creative than we have, in a good way or in a bad way. And, um, and it's all, it helps us also to have a, an evolutive, an evolutive um, uh, guidance that can also uh, um, react to some new uh, dark patterns. And the last, uh, obviously, the last uh, principle that applies from GDPR is privacy by design. Uh, which is something that is not the most easy to enforce, but uh, one of the, I think, one of the big expectations from the GDPR legislators uh, regarding these aspects. Thank you. Dries, would you like to continue? Yeah. Yes, I'm happy to. Thank you, Natalia. And I, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot to say, and I'm <laughs> trying to be really, really sh as concise as possible. So. The question is twofold, right? On the one hand, what le legislation is upcoming, mm -hmm. which I think would probably almost uh, justify a separate debate because there's so much coming up. 
um, particularly, <clears throat> I mean, I'm not so sure, of course, about the privacy realm, but particularly in the consumer protection and platform regulation realm, we are um, looking at the DSA, which, of course, I think is the first European piece of legislation that explicitly mentioned our patterns, whether we're happy with it or not. Um, I think there's also um, the Data Act, which is going to have some implications. Uh, but I really want to focus on um, the existing legislation and the potential changes that are going to take place in that in generic consumer protection. So uh, I already mentioned the UCPD, which I would say is our main tool and also the main basis on which we wrote our guidelines. And I'm massively happy with the UCPD in terms of fighting dark patterns because it, it actually uses to to the large degree, it has some per se prohibitions, but it, it uses open standards. And these open standards are applicable to new developments. Um, they're technology neutral. So they're, we're very happy with them. Yet we think there can be some changes made to the legislation. And I'm not sure to what degree many of you are aware of this, but the European Commission is currently doing some kind of revision of the UCPD, and it's called the um, uh, fitness check on digital fairness. So they're basically going to look at the UCPD in terms of does it still protect consumers uh, to a degree that we need in the digital economy? And that also, of course, entails looking at dark patterns and protection against dark patterns. So in that perspective, there's a couple of changes that we would advocate. Um, the first one is that we clarify um, or maybe blacklist, as we call it in, in UCPD jargon, which means just prohibit. Um, uh, some of the most harmful practices out there. Um, even though we may be able to qualify them under the current open standards, it may sometimes just bring certainty to the market to have some clear-cut clear, clear -cut prohibitions. Um, another way, another approach would be to introduce a duty of care, or maybe closer to what Bertrand said, instead of privacy by design, fairness by design. So make that a demand to the market. Um, there may also be room for some uh, to prescribe some mandatory design elements. I think the great one, a great example that I love and which has been introduced, I think, by both the German and the French legislator, is the um, requirement that you can end a subscription in two clicks and no more, um, which I think is is fabulous. Um, yeah, there is some more. Uh, uh, these get really technical, so I'm, I'm probably let me just quickly see if I can take the most important ones. Well, I'm going to mention this one anyway, because I think it also feeds into, in the, into the privacy realm. When we look at dark patterns, we see that businesses create dark patterns. But what we also know is that there are third parties who are very often in a B2B uh, relationship with the actual seller who facilitate or provide tools that can be implemented and create dark patterns in a commercial space. So there is software developers that do this. There are platforms that you know can sometimes do this. Um, and there's also, for example, large online marketing businesses that do this. Currently, none of these are liable under generic consumer protection law. However, they do create the problem to a large extent. So one of the other um, proposals that we've made is to really revise whether these uh, businesses should be liable under consumer protection law. And I think, I think, I'm not, I mean, I'm not an expert on privacy law, but I would expect that many of the features that we see in privacy that are being used, the cookie banners, the consent, are very often also not billed by the businesses on whose websites they appear. So there's probably some parallels there. Um, like I said, a lot to be, a lot more to be said about this, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it here for the moment. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else wants to add something on, on the regulations before we go on to the next section? Yeah, I'll just throw in a couple yeah. things from the US context. I know yes. we're in Europe, but I, th <laughs> but I think there's some exciting things happening in the US context as well. So there are two different regimes of enforcement that we're starting to see uh, really come into their own. Uh, one is the Federal Trade Commission, um, which has consumer and data protection authority in the United States. And the way that they've been combining those forces around dark patterns issues, especially just in this last six months, has been quite interesting to watch um, because they're able to wield those powers sort of in parallel with each other in different ways than we're seeing in the European market. 
Um, and there have been some large fines, uh, like the, the Fortnite Epic Games case, uh, where they were fined over $500 million, half of that relating to dark patterns uh, that made it uh, too easy to um, buy things in-app. Um, and so a lot of that's going to come out in settlement. The other thing that I think is, is going to be very interesting to watch is uh, the California data protection um, law coming into enforcement uh, and starting to see what kinds of cases emerge from that. But we're also seeing uh, similar laws uh, that also name dark patterns in a number of other U.S. states. And so that's going to add complication to the market. But I think it's also going to add some of these very specific prohibitions that are going to look different and probably look different from an enforcement profile than the European market. Thanks. What are you on? No, as you want. No, I think I think it's uh, the I, I'm I'm really kind of keen that we move on to the next yes. question because I think it's <laughs> not because of time, but uh, and because this is really interesting. But what I think is, and in, in in my position, kind of the question I very often ask myself is, is is kind of you know the the relative value, and I think both are are essential of these kind of big open standards regulation that set principles and but that are very open to interpretation honestly not the easiest to say okay but then is this legal is this illegal it doesn't kind of give you that answer but then the very and like more precise very practice based bits of regulation that we're starting to see you know around uh, either specific to a specific context so we're seeing more and more things around for example kind of retail investment platforms uh, which i think is really interesting the Germans here are moving kind of probably before everyone else as well on this. Um, and then, or, or kind of on like a very specific practice. So for example, you know, the UK kind of pushing guidelines saying, well, here's what's happening with an urgency countdown. And, and doesn't go as far as saying this is illegal, it says something. Uh, and I think the, the, it's, it's, uh, there's a really interesting kind of question around how do we kind of progress? And it's like, and you really see it kind of like, building bit by bit, centimeter by centimeter, where, where we're trying to mm. define uh, exactly what's, what's legal and what's not. And I think the intersection of these two, these two kind of broad principles and very, very kind of nitty gritty bits of regulation is, is really the way you want to move forward. And, and this is where, you know, and, and from kind of all the, we work both with the data protection authorities and the consumer protection authorities, and we're seeing both take a very similar approach, which is, yes, we need the principles, but then we also probably the practical way to go is to focus to go practice by practice, uh, and try and kind of advance little by little on practices, uh, which which yeah. is this next question. Which is so, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, which help us to move next to the next question um, about defining dark patterns. Yeah, you right? don't so, pay me for transitions, but <laughs> yes. maybe Natalia, just if I if I may, yeah. what, very quickly, one more thing I'd love to add is. Um, very often, and I'm not sure how this is in the privacy realm, but in the generic consumer protection realm, we see the legislators seeking solutions in, in transparency requirements, right? So there is a problem, all right, let's inform the consumer and now he can make a well-informed decision. I hope we're not moving in that direction with regards to dark patterns. Um, we are having those discussions with businesses sometimes. So we, we, we recently had a business who had fake reviews on its website and then we started telling them, you know, you, you can't do this, you have to stop. And they asked us, so what if we disclose on the website that we cannot guarantee that all reviews are real? And we're like, no. Um, so, so but, but this, yeah, but we're all laughing, but this is the debates that we're having sometimes with legislators. So that, that would be my final cautionary remark. In the realm of dark patterns, if we start legislating, please let it not be transparency requirements. Great. No, but it's, I mean, sorry, now I'm <laughs> <laughs> unbearable. The, no, but this is, this is, I think, and you're, you're saying kind of one thing that's super important as well, and this is probably what our main fight is, is, you know, very often when you go to people who work on behavioral science and people will come to us saying, so how can you get consumers to better protect themselves? Yeah. And how can you get people to consume less meat? And how can you get, it applies to all sorts of things is what I'm trying to say is, and, and we're constantly kind of waving the flag of improve the systems, don't make the customer very exactly. old. And we're seeing when we're doing interviews with businesses, we're doing interviews with regulators as well. And not later than two days ago, I was having a conversation with, someone who's in charge of an investigation on a business and I said well you know like what do you think about the fact that what should we do about the fact that most people who actually buy this product buy it while in movement and there is a lot of dark patterns now that can you know systems that can detect that you're moving and adapting to the way they're showing information I mean the, the field 
you know, we're going to talk about practices <clears throat> that were kind of codified, recognized years ago. If you look at what's happening now, what businesses are doing, it's mind blowing. You know, we're, we're and then maybe we're going to talk about this as well, kind of how do we make sure that we're not chasing the ambulance constantly. But uh, and so I was saying, basically, imagine all the, consu the, the customers are buying stuff on the bus. Their attention is going to be limited. They're not going to pay as much attention. They're going to be on a phone. What do we do with this? It's like, well, they should buy at home. And, and that's very much the answer very often. It's like, well, if you're going to decide to buy something on a bus, it's your fault. Uh, what do we do with that? Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, let, let me <laughs> probably uh, yeah. move on. Uh, <laughs> because I'm, we, ha I'm, we have I'm really, happy. really deep, interesting questions to discuss. <laughs> So let, let's just move on to the next yeah, one, right? I'll try. Um, so <laughs> we, we want to discuss what the We're unified <laughs> definitions of dark patterns, right? So there are many different ways of defining them. There are, there are different types of dark patterns. So which definitions would be acceptable um, for policymakers and regulators? And which definitions already exist in other spaces like in, in the academia? I, I would like Colin to, to start now the conversation. Okay. <laughs> This is, a, this is a long conversation, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, so I, I think we've had a lot of knowledge building that's happened in, in the academic space in the last five years, which has started to wrangle this, uh, what is sometimes a chaotic space. But I think there's a lot of convergence around sort of a high level abstract definition of what dark patterns contain. And in fact, the slide that Natalia started with um, shows you know, these sort of two high level definitions from the California authorities and then from the DSA as well. And both of those definitions have I think some high level characteristics in common, which we can say apply broadly across all of the low level dark patterns types that we've been able to observe. Now, one of the challenges here is that in terms of knowledge building, the practice of dark, thinking about dark patterns came from Harry Brignall and from the UX practitioner community. And so they were naming these very low level UI based patterns. Um, and what was sort of missing in that conversation early on was this sort of architectural sense about where dark patterns emerge within, in relation to a broader system architecture, in relation to code, and in relation to the temporal user experience, and not just what are they, is somebody seeing statically on a page that we can capture in a screenshot. And so um, over the last couple of years in particular, we've started to see some really um, rapid convergence. Uh, there have been typologies proposed, including my own, and one from Arunesh Matur and others, uh, that have started to wrangle the space, thinking about high-level and low-level patterns. And then the regulatory reports that came out last year did us a real favor as well by starting to consolidate the space even further. Um, and so um, our most recent entry to the space, uh, along with uh, collaborators Natalia and Christiana, um, that just came out last month is a preliminary ontology of dark patterns that maps uh, these main academic sources and all the regulatory sources into um, high level, meso level, and low level patterns. Um, and so these all are consistent with these high level definitions of what dark patterns are and how they sort of prey on our um, cognitive abilities um, and the way that we use digital systems. Uh, but this also reflects the fact that dark patterns are going to be manifest at a low level in an interface, whether it's a voice user interface, whether it's AR, VR, whether it's uh, an app or, um, or a website. Uh, but there are some higher level abstractions that we can start to use to really discipline our mind about the space, understand what some of the cognitive biases or design approaches are that are actually subverting user expectations or autonomy. And we can use those predictively to figure out what other kinds of dark patterns might emerge, both in well-known contexts and in emerging technology contexts. So I think that helps at least maybe start the conversation on, on knowledge types and, and dark patterns definitions. Thank you. Uh, Bertrand, would you like to... Tell us what kind of dark patterns can be considered uh, at the CNIL. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, so for for us, as I just mentioned in the first round of discussion, uh, we it's useful to have technology neutral approach and to have general principles on which we base our decision. And I think it's something also uh, when decisions are made by non-specialists and 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 lawyers uh, advocating for, for or against, they're, at this stage, they're, they're, more comfortable, they're more comfortable with general principles such as transparency, privacy. Even privacy by design is quite new. They, it's difficult to handle for them. Um, uh, accountability as well, but the fairness or transparency are, are for legal people, it's, it's something that they, they can work with. But obviously, the goal, the ultimate goal, is to bring into their mindsets new concepts and 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 
and and new tools to say okay this is clear so what we i think so the fact that dark patterns are in the law now is a is also something that uh, lawyers will ask okay is it so how do i comply with th that high level definition and they would need to answer that question and and to advise their, their clients say okay you need to do that to avoid being in that category so um, and perhaps to to build on what on what Colin says, we we still so we, we try to integrate some of the of the ID. So there have been an, some other definitions in the ADP by guidelines that is, that is one input perhaps with a data protection regulator point of view that but it's not it's not I, I don't believe it is it will be used by the world by by regulators after that. What we've seen, I think, perhaps two two um, two examples of what we've seen in 2019 when we when CNIL issued a decision against um, a large uh, operating system provider, they're like the largest in the market. Uh, I think now the, the decision is minimized, so I'm not sure I am able to say the name <laughs> uh, about the cre the the uh, cre account creation on the on 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 this uh, operating system. Um, if you look at the decision, we're basically saying it's overloading. You, you have a dark pattern that it's in individual lines, it will be overloading. You have too many informations dispersed in different aspects, and it's it's not so it's not uh, compliant, and it's so it should be uh, it should be changed. But in 2021, in a decision against Facebook, this one I can tell uh, uh, about cookies, we. Perhaps we get, we got a little further well, because we cited a work from from Cambridge and MIT about the consent uh, figures uh, when you don't have a, a decline button on the on the first web page, and I know that it has been useful for the regulators to actually to convert what is obvious for the decision makers the fact that if you don't have a decline button you're incited to 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 click on accept but. To be able to put that into the into the the decision is, uh, I think it, it has been helpful, and to have further work on that will be helpful in the future. Perhaps one last point that I could mention is what we don't do, and we perhaps we should do, is look at we 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 all uh, friends of dark patterns here, if I can say, <laughs> uh, uh, from academia, from 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 regulators, and and we we. Uh, we don't, uh, we don't look that much to what the industry is doing, what, for instance, the advertising industry is doing. And I know that they don't call that dark pattern, they call that conversion improvement mechanisms, something that, that so th they have a whole range probably of tools that they're using to do the exact opposite that, that, don't want us, that, that we don't want them to do, but with different terms, perhaps without an academic approach, but really more business-oriented approach. Uh, what we don't have the time to do, but one, well, at one time I saw, I don't know, an advertising conference in Washington. I said, oh, we should go there because it's like uh, like uh, children, say, children are advertising how, how to make them click. It's, it was like the title of the panel was was really so different from CPDP. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and probably this is, perhaps there is a missing link to do there to go to, to uh, to, to do the correspondence between what the academia, the regulators see at dark patterns, and what is seen as good business practice by the by some of the some of the business industries. I think, can I can I Thank add you. something, yeah. Natalia, yeah. quickly? Yeah. That just just quickly, I think there is there is a definition that we kind of you know everyone uses sort of slightly different words, but there is a sort of we could all here in this room say yes, dark patterns or practices online of interfaces that manipulate influence use slightly different words, change the verb according to how bad you feel about them, uh, and consumers into doing something that they didn't intend to do before. And I think to me, this is the crucial bit that actually kind of also is, is the problem of, you know, how do you translate these principles and how do you also kind of create these bridges with the industry that, and they call it, my favorite term for it is digital engagement patterns. It's like, you know, and that's the idea is like, how do we engage? And, and this idea of like, yes, but how do you know what the consumer intended to do at the beginning? And the entire field of marketing is about encouraging someone to do something that they didn't necessarily intend to do before. Uh, and so kind of how do you reconcile this bit 
is is going to be crucial to everything kind of how are we going to enforce how do we how are we going to because you want something that becomes self-enforcing right we all know that we're not going to i mean i don't do this but you're not going to be able to kind of take everyone to court one by one the point is at some point something kind of creates itself and it starts self-enforcing um and 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 so this this bit around kind of what did the consumer intend to do and and how 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 much is it acceptable to shift the consumer's behavior is a mind-blowingly hard question. Uh, and I think this is kind of at, at the core of everything. After, you know, the work that people at Colin produce is super ultra useful to create lists, and you produce as well, sorry, <laughs> the, um, uh, that, that, you know, super useful to kind of create these taxonomies. Uh, are, they, are they useful on a day-to-day -day basis for regulators? They are for people like, uh, Brice and Bertrand were sitting at the table, who read these papers and, and can do them, you know, then there's work to be done to translate them, to, to, to translate them for everyday enforces. I'm sorry if I shouldn't. Was it, was it bad what I said? It's very readable. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually read the ontology. Uh, it's great. You should all read it. Um, but, and I think, and then, and then there's a separate question I'll just put on the table is, you know, is the term useful? Dark patterns? I think it is internally, and, and we're seeing more and more people want to hear about it. You know, when we organize kind of uh, sessions, sensibilization sessions, they call them in, in consumer protection agency and data protection agency, everyone shows up. People want to know what it is. People want to know the cognitive biases. People want to know why it works, how it works. And people constantly ask us questions about kind of like what happens in the brain. So they're interested, and there's interest around the world. But then is that fit for legal use? And is this what you're, are you going to write dark patterns in the law? And are you going to write dark patterns in a case? I think it's really interesting. Not many people will write, you know, <coughs> this practice is a dark pattern, as far as I know. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Dries, would you like to discuss? Yeah, thank you. You know, I, I think on, on many, in many ways, I'm going to agree a lot with Laura. Um, so I think, I will start out with being a bit provocative here, and I think it's what you said. In a sense, as an enforcement agency, enforcing the UCPD, I don't need a definition of a dark pattern. I don't need it. What I need to do is I need to look at a practice, I look at the law, and I see whether the two match or not. And if they match, I have a violation, and if they don't, I don't. However, so, I mean, this, is, this would be pretty short-sighted, right? Because, of course, we have the DSA coming up, and the DSA does actually include a definition or the word dark pattern. So it means that somehow, even in the legal field, we need to get an understanding of what we mean with the word dark pattern. Um, but even beyond that, I think the point that you made, Laura, I, I would say dark patterns are sexy and they sell. So in terms of communication, we often refer to dark patterns where we would never do that in a decision. Um, and I think the also the, the other uh, I would say benefit of having the terminology and, and joint definitions is that we, for example, here as two different legal groups, privacy people and generic consumer protection people, are more easily able to speak about this phenomenon, having a common vocabulary and having a common understanding of what we're talking about and, and how we look at it. So I think definitely it is useful to, to proceed in this field. The DSA is probably going to make it much more important than currently as a practitioner, as an enforcer, I don't really need a definition. Hmm. And, and do you think that mentioning a dark pattern in the case law would actually help building new cases? Um, this is just a little question on top. <laughs> in what sense? So if we were to write a decision that we would speak about dark patterns, yeah. I would fear that it would actually complicate matters unnecessarily because we, we interject new term, terminology that a judge would then start asking what we actually mean. So as long as we don't, I mean, I would, I would always be hesitant to introduce anything in a case and evidence that we don't need. I'm going to give you an example of one of the saddest days of my professional life. <laughs> um, it's not today. It's not today. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, we were very excited because a uh, consumer protection authority had asked us to help write bits of text for a case for, uh, for kind of the presentation. I don't know the word in English. <laughs> I should, but uh, for kind of like for the case, let's call it that. 
where we're asked to contribute lit bits of literature around what does behavioral science have to say about why a consumer is actually not going to pay attention to this bit of information. And we arrived with the literature and we built this demonstration, trying to make it experiential, it was awesome. And then the judge looked at it and was like, what's that? It's not applicable. And just pushed it aside. <laughs> And and it was just too general. It was not, you know, it wasn't super context specific. You're gonna love me because it's a great transition to the next question. <laughs> 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 um, it's, all, it's all been set up. <laughs> but no, but it's just, it's like you know, how do you how do you? It's it's is that is that usable? Is that context specific enough? Is that evidence fit for use? Uh, it applies as well to kind of like is the word fit for use then? You know, and then I think for now no. Bit sad. We still okay. seen as kind of like, you know, junk science by <laughs> some. So I, I think it's the right time to, to shift to the next question, and I think you will, you will just continue <coughs> then the conversation that, that you had just started. So the question we wanted to address is, of course, the evidence, right? So what kind of evidence, what kind of empirical research results for dark patterns uh, has been so far acceptable or can be acceptable in the future? Um, both for policymakers and for the regulators. Um, maybe yeah. Laura, you want to just sure. yeah, explain what, no, what you've been doing so far. Sure. So I think it's it's there is there has been a lot of research that I'm sure uh, a lot of you know very well a lot around kind of demonstrating the effects of some of these practices that we've been talking about. There is research that's been you know in simulated environment demonstrating very carefully the effect of dark patterns. You know, one of the most kind of known paper around this is um, Jorster Hillevitz's paper uh, and Jamie de Gore, I think, mm -hmm. the, uh, around kind of demonstrating, you know, kind of what mild dark patterns will do, what aggressive dark patterns will do. And, and that's actually been the basis of kind of, that's convinced a lot of people and that's been really useful. There've been other <coughs> papers we've been working on, on, on bits of work together around this as well, just kind of like demonstrating that they work and they affect behavior and they will realistically kind of tick that box that is in the law where you have to show that there has been impact on consumer behavior or, you know, internet user behavior. Um, that will, and you know, we've done also a bit of work, which I, I actually think is very cool uh, in Ontario with the uh, Ontario Consumer Protection Authorities as well this year around kind of uh, trading platforms and, and showing that gamification, dark patterns and other behavioral techniques on investment platforms have real impact on real world behavior. And so just for example, just to show you the, the kind of the scale of the problem, uh, we've showed that introducing kind of a points-based system that had zero monetary value, zero impact on anything that you were doing with your trading, encouraged people to trade 40, like to, to make 40% more trades than people who just were not in the gamification group. And so, so this type of work that we do and that shows that this has impact and that can be harmful to consumers, convinces regulators, policymakers, some of them, and we managed to kind of get the conversation. This is where the conversation around why we're all talking about dark patterns, why, you know, kind of internally and in, in kind of like policymaker circle, we can talk about them and the fact it matters. Um, even then, the first question we're asked is, but how big is this? How big is this problem? And this is why a lot of the research that we've been commissioned to do by policymakers and by regulators at the European level, at the country level is around scale. Uh, there's been, and it's not just us, of course, I'm saying us as a community of people who do this type of work, you know, the LSE has done this big piece of work for the, for, for the European Commission around kind of trying to quantify this, the scale of the problem. Uh, we're doing similar kind of bit of work right now with uh, the Competition and Market Authority in the UK. Uh, there's been work around kind of trying to quantify the, the magnitude of the presence of dark patterns on, on um, mobile apps. That's mobile app uh, <laughs> uh, on mobile apps. Um, and so, so the first question is scale. And I think this goes to kind of also a legal demonstration problem, which is, well, first show me there's, show me there's impact. And that's the first thing we're asked to show. And so this is where researchers kind of have to gather and say, okay, how do we show scale? It's not that easy, right? Because some of it is, some of it will be very easily detectable at scale. And I think, I mean, I don't know if you're going to talk about some of the work you guys have been doing around kind of detection that scale of some practices, but but that's interesting and there's also it, but it's it's also not that easy. And very often what it looks like is we're training hundreds of people to do audits on websites. It's it's very manual still. Uh, if anyone has built a chat GPT extension that does that, let me know. Um, 
<clears throat> and uh, and also then, sorry, last bit of work is that once you've done all this, it still isn't enough to convince a judge or a stuff. Sometimes it's not even enough to go in front of a judge. It's not even to convince anyone to try and prosecute. Um, and, and this is where what the regulators have been asking us is for really kind of give us quantifiable, absolutely unattackable evidence in a context specific on a specific type of population of the effect of this specific pattern. Concretely, they're saying, you know, we want to start a case against company A, show us that on the website of company A in my country in this time period, this is at an impact. It's doable. It's expensive. Uh, it's slowish. Uh, and, and, and so this is where, uh, and so people like, so we, we've been trying to kind of, and this is where I think what I was trying to say at the beginning around kind of this kind of intermediary role that we're trying to play and we're trying to build tools for regulators is, is we invest a lot of time in trying to kind of construct ways for regulators to be able to experiment quicker and to build this evidence themselves quicker. And so we build behavioral audits tools with them, for them. We train their staff in trying to be able to use them. And when I say staff, it's not just, you know, kind of the innovation team or the tech team or, or the really, really highly skilled specialists. It's every agent that actually controls a website. Um, and we also try and we we'll run studies for them, but I think it's, it's kind of like, how do you create tools to make this evidence gathering easier? And then the, the point of like the training of the staff is also, you kind of hope that at some point people will go over the idea that you need to demonstrate the impact on a specific website at a specific time, and then you'll create enough kind of precedents so that then the practice becomes into law. And, and we've seen some examples of, you know, a first big case kind of leading to, to jurisprudence and then to leading to kind of like regulation that makes it very clearly uh, illegal to do a specific practice. But that's going to be practice based and it's painstakingly slow work. So. Hmm. Okay. Kole, would you like to share with us also your, your um, experience <laughs> with building evidence? Yeah, I love that you said junk science because that, so I was working on a case uh, for a couple of years uh, by the state of Arizona uh, uh, brought against Google LLC. And in fact, it's probably the, th that was probably the worst day of my professional career was <laughs> the day that I got a, a motion to dismiss my testimony um, because they were basically, well, you look at the table of contents and it's like, Dr. Gray doesn't know how to do this and he doesn't know how to do that. And his oh. work relies on junk science because um, they were trying to dismantle this notion that deceptive design practices and dark patterns not only were present in their product, but that it was even a useful lens um, to, to um, be starting to look at these things. So. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I think the issue that you raised of whether the term is fit for purpose is a really important one. To me, the value add is still that it's connecting people that would have never been connected otherwise. And I think this is really critical for the evidence stage that we're really in now in terms of form forming this community. Because um, I would have honestly never probably met people like Natalia and Christiana. I would have never known how to have a conversation with them uh, because I'm a designer. I'm a social scientist. Um, we didn't have a, a sort of a knowledge base to interact around. So when we think about generating evidence, I think we need evidence of many different forms. Um, and so this is work that we're starting to do and starting to look at a little bit more closely. Um, in case law, there isn't a lot to go off of at this moment in time uh, for reasons I think that have already been discussed. It doesn't need to be disclosed, disclosed in case law or it's part of the argumentation period, but it doesn't really ever make its way into the final decision. Um, but I think understanding what forms of evidence that we can generate as academics, as regulators, as, um, as designers is going to be really, really uh, important and critical. Um, so there are a few different angles that I think might be um, useful as at least a starting point. Uh, one is looking at the academic research that's already been done on dark patterns. Uh, we put out a systematic review um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at um, about 70 sources that have been published in the last, um, the last decade or so, um, and it, it, that number is increasing pretty dramatically, um, and looking at what are some of the underlying methodological practices that are supporting that. Some of these are large experiments at scale, um, but there are also some uh, content analyses, which actually are the, probably the most critical form of evidence gathering that have shown us what um, sort of the breadth of the problem. You know, so these are the kinds of studies that tell us that you know, 90 plus percent of apps include one or more dark patterns, or 90 plus percent of um, consent banners include one or more forms of dark patterns. Those are still manual inspection techniques that we do need to find ways to automate or at least support um, human in the loop um, alongside detection or um, automated detection. Uh, there are also other studies, though, which I think have been underutilized or under, um, under, underestimated, um, which is the studies that companies themselves are doing on their own product. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and this is something that was a really powerful tool that came out in the Google um, case. Uh, we got discovery. We were able to look at a number of user studies that they had uh, conducted internally. Can't talk about the user studies that themselves, but uh, essentially it showed that users were very confused. And uh, that Google knew this for a really long time. They just refused to act on those decisions. Uh, but in fact, in general, those UX research practices have tremendous value for an organization to understand what's happening with their product and to direct their product decisions. And in that case, inaction was just as important as action. <laughs> they knew what the problem was, uh, but they refused to act. Um, and in many companies, you know, actually being able to understand based on A-B testing or based on even very small scale user studies that there's confusion or um, that these practices are being used to actually subvert user autonomy, um, I think are a really powerful tool that we haven't really utilized um, as much to date. So figuring out how to stitch together those academic community methods, which uh, I think are relatively well understood, but still underexplored in relation to dark patterns, especially around content analysis. Looking at those groupings of UX research methods, which have some similarities to academic methods, but they're deployed in different ways with different purposes, but have a lot of power to direct product. And then looking at how we can overlap that with um, the kinds of argumentation needed to actually make legal decisions. If we can solve that sweet spot in the middle, <laughs> life will be much happier for many of us. Thanks a lot. Dries, would you like to continue? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's so many angles to take on this. I think I just want to take two approaches. One is maybe to sort of convey what it is that we think or where we actually need the evidence um, and what we need it for. Um, and I think maybe um, this might be a little bit specific to the Dutch context, but I think it applies to most enforcement agencies, is that the first stage where we actually need um, evidence in terms of prevalence and harm of dark patterns is when we start selecting cases, when we're trying to prioritize, because of course we want to be doing the most important things, the most harmful things. So um, knowing what those things are requires <clears throat> some kind of knowledge on what's happening and to what degree that's harmful. Of course, and I think that was mentioned already by Laura, and, and which is probably the most obvious one, is you know we need to be able to demonstrate some kind of impact in terms of uh, bringing evidence on, on violations of the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. And lastly, and again, this may be more typical to the Dutch um, legal situation, but I'm not entirely sure on that. <clears throat> and I, I would expect that this probably starts sliding in, in other jurisdictions as well, is that increasingly it seems that the Dutch uh, judicial system is asking us to really motivate the level of a fine by showing the impact of those practices. So I think that's the three areas or the three reasons why and where we need the evidence. Um, thinking about the, the types of evidence that we can use, um, I, I would say that you know some of them have, have already been mentioned and I really have sort of four types of evidence in mind and I don't think it has really materialized you know, what the best type of evidence is, and it's probably always going to be a mixture. Um, but I th when I think about it, I think about the very generic evidence, right, that we have on uh, from psychological science, where we know, for example, that scarcity is a, is a strong bias and, and triggers people, uh, maybe more than other biases. So, so there, there's, there's on a very generic level is evidence. Um, I think then, secondly, of course, there are studies into the effects of specific uh, commercial practices. Uh, think, for example, about low stock messages. How do they work? How do generically, what are the generic effects of these? And then, of course, you know, like you said, we all, always actually really want to know how the specific um, uh, marketing practice impacts the consumers of business A when they buy product Y. But like you said, this is hugely re resource intensive and also takes a long time. So, I mean, it, it really doesn't speed up cases. <clears throat> and I'm not sure if we always need this. So uh, there, there seems to be a lot of thinking that we always need this. I don't think we do always need this. And the fourth one is, of course, the evidence, which I think um, Colin already alluded to, which is almost ever present in any business that conducts an online selling, which is the A-B testing or the, uh, the UX research out there. And of course, we have the powers to ask for the information and look at it. So I think these are the four types of evidence that I have in mind. And I'm not sure if that's completely useful in this discussion, but uh, it, I hope it is. I prefer to be called generic science than junk science. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> it's a progress. <laughs> 
Mr. Yeah, I, I I do not have a lot to add. I think we I agree <coughs> obviously with the fact that every decision is really context based on the you know, in our case the French users of specific type a specific type of web website and probably the the judges that that make the decision they they try to assess the distance between you know, one paper and the actual case they are, they are facing it and if they feel the distance. Like they say, okay, this is valid as it's a valid point, or I will get in an argument with the lawyers by saying, oh, it's it's a completely different, different study, and so so that's trying to map what the needs of the regulator, and we need to express what what we what kind of, of case we have is is important. Trying doing the anthology that you that you publish, for instance, and showing that it's scientific consensus consensus on things is also helpful to say. To avoid this, this legal discussion with the counterparts, so they say, okay, it's very specific. Saying no, no, it's not very specific. You have several studies that say it's all the same thing, and your case is not in any any of the studies, but it's it's close to them, and it is. So, and so we can build an argument. I think that that's that's uh, obviously uh, useful. I, I share the idea of of how it can help investigation methods and and, and help us to ask for UX studies, user studies. Of companies and say, okay, provide me with what you've seen, and probably you you have you have results that show that that you try to to deceive, for instance, users. Um, is a is an important aspect also. Perhaps two last things. One is uh, evidence is also dissuasive in my, in my sense. So the fact that you look at some dark patterns, qualify them as dark patterns, is also a way for a, si a signal for companies to say, okay, I should not do this one because uh, there is now a study showing that it is not, it is clearly, clearly deceptive. So, so it's also, so it's, it's a long work, but it it can be useful also to to work on, on on things that you you where it's clear that it should not be made. And the last point is is a, uh, is also uh, as, as mentioned by Dries. We will also take into account why is that dark pattern used for it? And it's very different. It's, it's still different to use that for cookies, which is like profiling people for sell ads to people, than to use dark pattern to sell plane tickets or to sell, uh, uh, to, uh, to engage people in a, in a loan for, for 10 years. Obviously, obviously the regulators will be more, more motivated to, to fight dark patterns that have strong impact on people, financial impact especially. Uh, and we, we, it's important to, yeah, to have in mind that we don't, we, we do, we, we would fight dark patterns not for themselves, uh, but also, but really f for what they used, uh, they used uh, in, in practice. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank all the speakers and we will open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, could you please use the microphone that's there? Thank you. The closer to the mic. Let me take this up. So I'm Simon Ania. I'm a data protection officer at Uber. Mm -hmm. And before I joined Uber, I had a similar role at TomTom, the navigation company. And I see a lot of energy and passion in this discussion. So that's why I dare come up with the next question. Because um, I operate in the on the cross section of um, online and the physical environment. And I can't help but thinking that in the context of commercial practices, which we've been focusing so far, what is considered a dark pattern, actually in the context of mobility, may be a safety pattern. So because we want people to behave in a certain way to nudge them into safe behavior. So I'd be interested if you could reflect on how you would relate uh, to the automotive industry where user interface is called human machine interface and all of the other terminology from a research perspective but also and what you could learn from that if you haven't done so and the other one is how that would pan out in the regulatory environment because we have consumer and markets regulator here we have a data protection regulator but the type approval bodies and regulators they are ahead of the curve because the, the device, the car, needs to be pre-approved to go into the market, which means that there is an opportunity to get it right beforehand. So how, how would you engage with that? 
Also, because there could be conflicting requirements. Let me give you an example. In 2010, I was part of the design of a navigation system into a French car. And at that point in time, the Data Protection Authority, uh, 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 together with consumer market authorities, because cookies just came around, were adamant that we should ask for consent because the driver could change every ignition of the vehicle. And then the safety folks said, but that's hugely unsafe because at that point in time, you don't want to be distracted by that machine because you have parking maneuvering to do. So how do we manage those, those conflicts? In an environment where with the advent of mobility as a service and the transactional element of, of sales being combined with the safety elements from elsewhere. So how do we marry this up going forward? Are we taking all questions? Or are we uh, no, no, we, we answer first. Answer yeah. first. But let's keep it too short, please, the questions, and, and, and let's be concise with the answers. Yeah, mm. I, I, I don't have uh, too precise answer. Uh, um, so perhaps to combine, the, sometimes you have legal requirements. Safety can be a legal requirement, and, and so obviously you... You will need to comply with that, and it, and it will be taken into account by the data protection authority if you if you're obliged to to do things, uh, or, or or prohibited to to do things by by a, le a legal provision. It's, it's important one, and the other one is uh, about the uh, the fact the user expectations, which is a difficult concept, but it, it has been included in GDPR, and it's it's also about. The, in that case, probably the user expects to be to be protected by by the system within the car, and uh, and you would need to have a design system where where uh, you separate what is strictly necessary for safety, what is strictly in, in within the user expectations, without perhaps consent, and 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 if you want to have add on added services. Even useful for the users, yeah. Try to to separate that and and provide information in different contexts. I, I'm not sure it's it's answering the questions. Probably not what the French DPS said in 2010, uh, but but uh, uh, it's. Uh, 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 I think we need to build on that to be able to say we don't want to bother the users all the times with interfaces where it's the the service that they expect is just provided normally. Uh, yeah. so, I think just, I, I don't know if that's the question you asked, but I'll answer something that I think is, is an interesting point in there around, you know, you say, well, a car has to have shown that it's passed all of these kind of safety guidelines to be able to be put on the market. And nothing about cars, so this is not the right word. But uh, Similarly, you know, to open a building, you have to have all sorts of things, loads of professions, you have to show that you have the right certificates, blah, blah, blah. It's true of loads of things. It's not true of websites. Right? To put a website online, I don't have to show that I've passed like a series of things. And I think that's, that's, it's, it's an interesting thought exercise, right? Should there be some form of certification authority that kind of sees a website before it goes online? Uh, it's, it's, no, I know. <laughs> I know, it's, I know sure, I'm like sure, killing sure the not. entire dynamism <laughs> of, of, of but, but, but there is something around, interesting around kind of like, is there, is there something technology enabled that, that, you know, I don't know. I think it's an interesting thought exercise. Uh, I'm happy to pick up on the nudging point after if you want, but because that's essentially what keeps us in business. But. <laughs> Please, yes. Excuse me, a quick and practical uh, question. You mentioned um, a paper. Uh, could you please perhaps uh, repeat the, the authors? You mentioned the review of sources. Could you perhaps provide the, the names of the authors so we can find can we them? Perhaps we can even kind of put them online or something. I don't know, but as a way of sharing yeah. resources. Um, I, I, think, I, I think, think many of the links are on the opening slides as well, aren't yeah. they? Not necessarily of the paper you mentioned, okay. of the, uh, the mildly aggressive. The paper of Colin, uh, Natalia, and Christine? So, no, no, so the one I mentioned is, is Lior Strahilovitz. S-T-R-A-H. We can take this offline, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the other two papers that were referenced were um, uh, towards a preliminary ontology of dark patterns. Um, Natalia, me, and Christiana, and um, a similar paper, um, Systematic Review of Dark Patterns Literature. And I'd be happy to get you the reference afterwards if you'd like. Okay. Please, yes. 
Yeah, thanks very much for, for sharing your thoughts. It's been really interesting to attend the panel. Um, I have one small comment and I have one question. The comment is I would just uh, slightly challenge Dries' notion about transparency not being the thing for us to focus on. I agree it should not be the only thing for us to focus on, but very much so in the internet, people, uh, people are very much dependent on information to be able to know what is happening with their data. And even though the GDPR has pushed for more transparency, we are still very much lacking in that space. So I would very much hope for more transparency, but also for more control. And I think that's also where the design patterns are and deceptive patterns are really important. I'm a UX researcher and designer, and as SciTech, I'm really thrilled to see that there is more attention to this link between design and privacy and uh, other effects on consumers. Um, I'm also slightly uh, worried that uh, we are coming up with um, a topic that we think is important to address, which I completely agree with. But if I think of the GDPR and how that has been enforced, I'm a bit unsure if we're actually be able to put uh, you know, our money where our mouth is and actually enforce things in the way that we want them to be. We are now six years or five years beyond the um, enforcement date, I guess, yesterday, five years of GDPR. And we still see a lot of problems with especially how things like cookie banners are being used. So my question to the panel is like, how hopeful are we that we are, are able to enforce these kind of measures in a more strict or more clear way so that consumers, but also companies that are designing products know how to move forward in a consistent and consumer respecting way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for coming forward with, with that comment. Um, and, and I'm happy to pick up on it because I was rather provocative on it. And I think I do agree with you that transparency absolutely has a place. Disclosures absolutely have a place in consumer protection. And there certainly is information that needs to be conveyed to consumers. I think also, and we've done research also to, to see how we can improve transparency. So we've done joint research, which is on our website, for example, in relation to pricing and ranking, um, where we also jointly with the business community looked at how we can improve transparency uh, messages. So I absolutely agree it has a place. I think where I came from when I made my more provocative um, um, uh, remark is that, you know, we sometimes really have the um, idea that the legislator seems to um, approach transparency requirements as a, um, a one size, <clears throat> sorry, fits all solution to all sorts of problems where it very often is actually not a solution. I mean, it's a political solution because you, it appears that you're protecting consumers and you're doing something, but in, in effect, you're not really doing much. So, so that's where I came from, but thank you for the comment. And perhaps for, for the, the question, I think it, it will be an endless battle. Uh, uh, it's normal, for, for me it's, it's quite normal. We would need to have more, more resources, more forces to enforce and, and but, but it will never end, actually. It's, it's like unfair commercial practices. It, it is not because you have a directive or a new directive that it unfair commercial practices will end. You will, the, the creativity is uh, infinite on that. <laughs> and and so, so the idea is really to, to, to have a process where it's improving every year, I guess. And, and I, I believe we, we're doing that. We are working on cookies. In the next coming months, we will work on mobile apps, so we will work less on cookies, but we will uh, work on another aspect, and we need to continue. Please, yes, thank you. Um, first of all, congratulations for a really interesting panel, uh, insightful panel. My name is Cornelia Kutter. I have just started to move into academia uh, at the Multidisciplinary Institute uh, in an artificial intelligence at the University of Grenoble. But I've been working for Microsoft for responsible tech and competition for many, many years. And before that, I had a legal department at the European Consumer Organization, BEOG. Uh, that was the time the UCPD was developed. And so I'm, I'm much of a fan of the UCPD as well uh, for that reason. Um, I have two questions, uh, largely for Colin and Trees. Um, and it goes a little bit on top of Simon's, Simon's question is um, this uh, nudging, um, there, is, um, there is always trade-offs, right? When you build uh, a user interface, you have to think about multiple things. It, 
and, and it can be security and safety versus clarity. Uh, you want to nudge into better behavior. We see this in artificial intelligence a lot where there is sort of this alignment discussions as well. So very concretely, I, I want you to put yourself on the other side for a minute and give an example what you would, you, what you would see as a countering um, argument for uh, a specific design. So that you need to have some borderlines and where do you see a borderline to uh, well, this is acceptable and this is not. So you will have these cases where this is not so easily defined, yes and no. I would like to so get you to talk a little bit about these borderlines. And then my second question is a very simple one is, in the DSA, um, the, um, there is this exemption for dark patterns if there is other laws and there is the UCPD. So is there room for the DSA to be applicable in this space at all? Thanks. Should I go? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much for those two questions. Maybe to start with the last one, I think it was part of the um, discussion on yesterday's panel as well. And I think the question about, you know, the what, is the, what does Article 25 in the DSA really mean? I think the, the, the predominant answer would probably be, we don't know yet. Um, and, and yes, of course, there is the exemption that everything that falls under <clears throat> the UCPD, but also under the GDPR, um, it, it, um, then it is exempted from the, uh, from the prohibition. So, um, you know, depending on how you actually interpret that exemption, um, it may be that, that there is not so much left that directly falls under Article 25, but we don't know yet. Um, also, because we don't know exactly yet how broad we uh, interpret the dark patterns that fall under the GDPR and the UCPD. So I think there's still quite a bit of, of room for development there, and, and we're, we're probably going to see the results in case law over the next few years, and I, I, I'm afraid I don't have anything more sensible to say about that, but that's just the reality that we're faced with at the moment. And I, I would say, I mean, in a sense, one could say that Article 25 would be sort of a safety net option, right? So if it doesn't fall under the UCPD and GDPR, and it is in relation to large platforms, we at least have some sort of fallback option. That, that's, I think, how a lot of people look at it currently. Um, I would say that a lot would currently be covered by the UCPD, so I'm not, I'm not so sure about the GDPR, but I would have a sense there too which I think it would mean that Article 25 will be the fallback, but if it turns out that a lot does not fall under the GDPR and the UCPD, it would be the other way around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a, yeah, no, yeah, go, I don't, go ahead. Yeah, for the first part of the question, I mean, it's a, it's a challenging one and I cannot exhaust it in a couple of minutes that we probably have here, um, but, certainly there's a counterbalance. And so that's why in some of my initial work, I described dark patterns as an imbalance of shareholder and user value. Um, and certainly there are some dark patterns that appear to be much more uh, malicious, coercive, um, overtly manipulative rather than deceptive or just like light nudges. I think the challenge that we're seeing, and this is still a sort of unresolved question in the literature, is the compounding effects of these dark patterns. And so there may be some dark patterns that feel in isolation is relatively innocuous, like confirm shaming, where it's just like, why don't you want to join our email newsletter? You know, uh, But if you compound that with three or four other dark patterns in the same user flow, suddenly you have a situation where it's very difficult for a user to exercise their autonomy. And so certainly we can talk about that as degrees of agency or autonomy. Um, but when we think about nudging, nudging for what purpose? Is the user in on the nudging secret? of what's happening to them? Are they aware? What kind of cognitive or perceptual biases are being um, sort of leveled? And are they perhaps part of a vulnerable group as well? Um, and so there are lots of these compounding concerns that we have to consider. Can I, can I just jump in really quickly on this? Um, the, I mean, first, you know, we know that knowing your biases and knowing what, an, what nudges can do to you is not enough. Uh, and, and, that we've, and that's been very well documented. Where I think your point is very interesting, and I think it goes back to a similar point earlier, is there are a lot of well-intentioned companies, and, and I, I agree all of this work is necessary, and there's still you know, all of the needs around kind of like what is innocuous, what is not, what is harmful, what is not. All this work needs to keep going. But in the meantime, what does a well-intentioned company do? And how do they test for whether their design is harmful to a consumer? And I think there is a real bit of work to be done around 
can we do a little can we help them with a little bit of a checklist mm -hmm. it's not going to be perfect it's not going to be it's of, of course there are going to be holes in it and it needs to get kind of kind of you know evolve with time but can we help them with guidelines around here are ways to test that you're not actually kind of harming your consumers here are ways to test that the way you've set your privacy concern and you're doing it this is basically what the guidelines of the CNIL do the guidelines of other kind you know data protection agencies do is like here's how to be a good guy I don't know that we have that kind of, you know, more broadly for how you design your sa your sale interface, how you design your, your, your de you design your kind of product comparison sites, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's a piece of work that we'd be very, very happy to do more on because I think it kind of, you know, not everyone wants to put unfair practices on their website. There are a lot of actually very decent business people uh, and, and that just kind of don't have the tools to know exactly. And, and it goes to the point you were making earlier kind of the battle, the uphill battle against, I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to name people, uh, against, against kind of, you know, all of these training programs that we see on like how to create the best drop shipping sites overnight. That's super harmful and we have nothing against it. We have nothing to be like how to create the nicest website for your consumer in a way that's actually going to protect them. Uh, and so, so I think there's this work to be done there and, and, and this, is, this is an area that we're not doing enough of. I think on this point, we'll have to conclude our panel because Sorry. we are five <laughs> minutes Sorry. behind. Um, can you please take, take the question offline, yes. please? Um, thank you very much again for everyone, for all the thank speakers. You. Thank you.